Well, thank you, Dean LaDuke. Um, that was a much nicer introduction than one I received not too long ago when I was introduced as one of the finest judges that money could buy. Um, <laughs> my wife, Mary Kathleen, who was with me at that event, was introduced by the same master of ceremonies as being one of the finest ladies to walk the streets. And uh, she and I were both perplexed by her introductions, but um, we know there was a good heart behind those. When Dean LaDuke asked me if I would participate in this event, um, I said to him, Dean, I understand that you're teaching your students at Cooley. What's wrong with my decisions? To which he replied, oh, no, Your Honor. We let them find that out for themselves. Um, so I quickly decided this was a place I had to be. When I do come to law schools, though, I think about the experience of the former dean of the Columbia Law School many years ago. He had been the dean at Columbia for many years until the mid-1970s when the governor at that time of New York State, Nelson Rockefeller, asked him if he would consent to taking over the administration of the then very troubled prison system in New York State, which had been the subject of a number of violent um, um, incidents, and um, the governor was seeking to try to do something to improve the circumstances in those facilities. And the Columbia dean said, sure, I'll be glad to do this for a few years, and he did that, and he very successfully uh, strengthened the prison system in the state. But he tells the story of how when he went back to New York City, he would frequently be walking on the streets of the city, and he'd run into a young man or young woman, and he couldn't quite recall whether he had met that young man or young woman at Columbia or at the prison facility. So he developed kind of an all-purpose uh, reply when they said hello to him. He said, well, how's the law been treating you, young man? <laughs> well, it is an honor for me to be here today. Um, it's an honor to address Cooley Law School's 2013 John Marshall Class Graduation Ceremony. I've been privileged to have spoken here at moot court competitions and awards banquets and national conferences and before Cooley student organizations, but it's of course very special to participate in this afternoon ceremony to recognize the achievement that each of you in this class has worked so hard to attain. I congratulate each of you, and I extend special congratulations to parents who've under, undertaken financial commitments, spouses who've accepted extraordinary responsibilities and obligations, and friends and family members who've provided support in so many different ways while tolerating the somewhat odd and eccentric behavior of the law student. I note in particular, as I came in, the sense of astonishment on the faces of more than a few here today that members of their family and their friends are now on the verge of becoming members of the bar, a sense of astonishment that was entirely shared by my own family and friends at my graduation ceremony nearly 40 years ago. They simply never thought it was possible. Cooley is not only a genuinely diverse law school in terms of the personal histories and interests and aspirations of its student body, but it is also a law school distinguished by many students who may well be the first among their families to become members of the bar, and that too is a special cause for celebration today. Now what words of wisdom to share with as various a group of lawyers to be as there are in this audience today. In the few minutes I have, it is difficult to summon the great insights of our profession or to share much that is truly profound. Of course, however, one really can't go too far astray by reiterating the tried and true. Work hard, the, word, the world doesn't owe you a living, get a mentor, take time to smell the roses, reach for your dreams, and most importantly, keep the billable hours honest. And in truth, each of these is pretty good advice, and if you take away nothing more from my remarks than these thoughts, 
you and I will both have done pretty well this afternoon. However, I would add to this litany what I view as the timeless yet largely forgotten advice of a mid-19th century lawyer, one Abraham Lincoln Esquire, whose admonition I have always thought quite worthy. He said, if you wish to be a lawyer, get books, sit down anywhere, and go reading for yourself. That will make a lawyer of you faster than any other way. Reading, reading, and more reading is the main thing. And that shall be my own great contribution to your legal education this afternoon. Get books. Lincoln, I'm sure, would not object to a Kindle or a Nook. <laughs> Sit down anywhere. Lincoln, I'm equally sure, would not insist on you doing so within a log cabin, and a candle needn't be your illumination, and go reading for yourself. Reading, reading, and more reading is the main thing. I quite agree with that. You will prosper if you adhere to Lincoln's advice. For as fine as your legal education has been at Cooley, and I know and hold in the highest regard many of the professors who doubtlessly tormented you here, your legal education must now continue by dint of your own resolve and initiative if you are ever to become the great and respected lawyer as surely many of you wish to be. Not a continuing legal education, I emphasize in the sense of enrollment in a CLE program, an activity mandated by many states, but not, I'm pleased to say, by Michigan, but instead a continuing legal education program in furtherance of what I, was, of what I would describe as the deep legal education that each of you have received here at Cooley, an education of which you may not even have been fully cognizant. You have, of course, been well trained at Cooley in a knowledge and understanding of the requirements of the law, and you've learned the rules of criminal and civil procedure and of evidence, and you've been instructed in the precepts of constitutional law and contracts, and you've been introduced to the statutory regimes of taxes and civil rights. And as a result, if you've been reasonably conscientious and diligent in your studies, there's not one of you who should not be well prepared to perform successfully on the bar examination. After which, of course, each of you can then promptly forget the rule in Shelley's case and the rule against perpetuities to name just two principles of law that seem in retrospect to me to have required disproportionate energies on my part in the course of bar preparation in light of my subsequent need to ever actually utilize these principles in the practice of law. In my first 40,000 or so cases on the Supreme Court, I have not yet been actually required to apply my learning as to these principles. But all this training pertains to your surface legal education. Of course you must maintain and build upon the foundation of your current knowledge of the rules of law as time passes and as these rules evolve, but all that should be obvious to you. What, however, may be less obvious is that each of you must also nurture the more subtle aspects of the education that you have received at Cooley, the deep education, if you are to realize your fullest potential as a lawyer. That is, you have not only been trained in the black letter of the law, but you have also been educated in the law as a discipline, as a liberal art. It is an education complementing your knowledge of the rules of the game with what Professor Llewellyn described as a necessary sense of vision, range, depth, balance, and humanity. You may have had no courses especially devoted to this deep education, but at the same time, each of your courses has been devoted to this. And the deep education in becoming a lawyer you have received during the past three years has cut across the boundary lines of your curriculum. That is, as students of this deeply legal education, you have in countless cases had to analytically distinguish between what is similar and what is dissimilar in the patterns and circumstances of different cases. Does the rule in case A or the rule in case B 
properly control the results in case C. And you have in countless cases had to analytically assess which similarities and, dissimilar and dissimilarities were critical and significant and which were not. Such abstract thinking is a critical part of the equal protection of the law by ensuring that like cases are treated in the same fashion today as they were yesterday and that unlike cases will be treated in a distinctive fashion today as they will be tomorrow. Such thinking like a lawyer is what separates ad hoc decision making in which, what, in which what is paramount is the rule of judges from consistent and principled decision making in which what is paramount is the rule of law, the great achievement of our civilization and an institution of which you will all soon be one of the custodians. As a further part of your deep legal education, each of you at one time or another has studied the three prongs of the classical curriculum known as the trivium, the three great roads of education. You have been instructed in logic and reason, in ascertaining the proper application of legal principles and precedents to newly arising cases and controversies. You have learned rhetoric, through your moot courts, your classroom discussions, and your oral advocacy. And you have been educated in grammar and syntax through your briefs and legal writings, your law review experiences, and your exposure in your case books to memorable and outstanding judicial opinions in which precision of language, nuance of expression, and the articulation of fine distinctions in critical thinking have been central. But there's still more of your deep education, even though no specific grade may have been attached to what you've learned in these areas. In your clinics and your domestic relations courses, you have had to ponder whether advocacy and litigation are required and where healing, reconciliation, and counseling instead are what is necessary. That is, where legal argument alone can solve a problem and where instead personal insight and an understanding of hearts and minds must be brought to bear in reaching a solution. You have learned about matters of economics, finance, trade, and the realities of the marketplace in your courses on corporation and partnerships. You have been introduced to jurisprudence and legal philosophy in assessing the debates between Justice Harlan and Justice Black over how the law is to be given meaning. You have traced the history and development of our legal heritage in your courses on civil liberties in the Constitution. You have been exposed to the debates and divisions that have informed the laws that has matured over the decades and centuries in such everyday areas of dispute as torts and property. You have been witness to the contrasting attitudes of men and women of good faith concerning fairness and due process as principles that underlie our legal system. And in your studies of our remarkable common law, you have learned the customs and the traditions and the values of ordinary people as they have evolved from medieval times. In short, you have been educated in logic, in problem solving, in rhetoric, in disciplined and reasoned thinking, in an understanding of human nature and the human condition, in legal and judicial philosophy and ethics, in resourcefulness, in business practice, in critical judgment, in clear-headed thinking and communication, in an appreciation of the infinite variety of interpersonal relationships, in history and civics and government, and in the application of imagination, creativity, and innovativeness. To think like a lawyer, to think like a good lawyer, is to bring to bear in appropriate ways and circumstances each of these studies and disciplines. And I do believe that the very best lawyers nurture these parts of their legal education long after their graduation ceremonies and bar examinations. Your deep legal education will not be reinforced by your bar courses, it will not be tested by your bar examinations, and it will not be supplemented by the CLE courses you may choose to take someday, but it can only be enhanced by reading, reading, and more reading. 
that and that alone in my judgment, as with Abraham Lincoln's, will make a lawyer out of you, at least the kind of lawyer that each of you has the potential someday to become. Yours is a remarkable profession in which the totality of human experience serves as the everyday backdrop of your practice. You know, in Michigan, despite 500 thick and densely written volumes of Michigan reports in the 175 years of our statehood, and an additional 300 volumes of Court of Appeals reports, our appellate judiciary is still confronted on an almost daily basis with cases and controversies of first impression, cases in which new varieties of disputes have arisen, in which new combinations and permutations of human relationships and disputes are reflected in ways not controlled by any existing law, and in which the human condition is reflected in a manner not quite like anything with which the law has been previously engaged. To paraphrase Oliver Wendell Holmes, the life of the law is not only experience, but it is logic and reason and clear-headed thinking and a sophisticated and nuanced awareness and understanding of human strengths and weaknesses. And each of you can best grasp this life of the law by reading, reading, and more reading, and thereby continuing the fullness of your legal education at Cooley. One final thought, probably an obligatory final thought at a ceremony such as this, and Jacob Levine briefly mentioned it, but your chosen profession is a remarkable and singular one in another way as well. Namely, it is a profession governed by elaborate and broad-ranging rules of ethical conduct. Membership in the bar, it has been observed, is a privilege burdened with conditions. Some of you may recall the philosophy of a former Detroit Pistons basketball coach, Larry Brown, who repeatedly emphasized that his teams must win the right way. The same with each of you. It is not enough to prevail on behalf of your client, but you must do so the right way, and if you fail to do so, you risk your membership in our great profession. What is perhaps most remarkable is that our code of ethics defines mostly minimum standards of conduct, not what constitutes generally professional standards and behavior. To understand this, you must understand the distinction between ethics and professionalism. As one form, former jurist has stated in this regard, unlike ethics, the requirements of professionalism impresses no official sanctions and offers no official rewards, yet sanctions and rewards exist unofficially. Who faces a greater sanction than lost respect? And who faces a greater reward than the satisfaction of having done right for right's own sake? You do not want to be a lawyer whose behavior can be attested to as ethical only after your state's code of ethic has been scoured and your conduct scrutinized with a microscope. Take your ethical obligations seriously for these are taken seriously by those who administer these rules, and they are taken seriously by almost all of your colleagues with whom you will soon be practicing. Your standards must not be minimal compliance with the letter of our rules, but maximum compliance with their spirit. There is one thing of which I have no doubt. The graduates of this law school, and I've had several law clerks and legal interns from Cooley, can compete, and they can flourish at the highest level. Justice Brandeis once described the struggle that underlies a legal education, the sheer resolve and determination in law school to overcome difficulties, which according to him, will probably do the most to strengthen your will and mind for the law. Do not place limits upon your ambitions, but do steel yourself to ensure that your own individual struggles and difficulties serve to strengthen your will and your mind for the law. Make yourself good or great or indispensable at some aspect of the law. As that same 19th century lawyer of whom I've earlier remarked, Abraham Lincoln Esquire, also once counseled, whatever you are, whatever you become, 
become a good one. And I believe one way of becoming a good one is to read, read, and read more. This will make a lawyer of you quicker than any other way. Thank you for inviting me to share this wonderful day with you and your friends and family. Each of you can be proud of your accomplishments and for what these and portend for your future achievements. Congratulations and best of luck to each of you.